Hi, my name is Anne. Welcome to my home worm farming channel. I want to make sure that everybody knows that they can ask questions at any time in the comments below because this is a friendly, helpful community. There are no dumb questions and I do try to answer every single one of them. Today, we're going to care for my 55 gallon or 208 liter food grade worm bin, which is made out of a barrel. And we lovingly call him Blue. I'll run through a harvest aeration and feed of the 10-ish pounds or five kilograms of a mixed species environment here that have red wigglers, blue worms, and European night crawlers. And I'm gonna talk about how I also store my castings to keep them alive in the winter. Comment down below, how do you keep your castings over the course of the winter before you need them in the spring? So first off, what I wanted to start with was the screen sizes. Now these are available in the Amazon links below. I did buy the whole kit. I don't use all of them very often, but they do come in a range for a size about this big, which is almost an inch, which is about two centimeters. This screen is about two centimeters or one inch. And this is what I use when I am trying to get things prepared. Um, I did this earlier on in the week, but what I did was I took a lot of the castings and I ran them through this big screen so that anything large I could pull out so the smaller part could have a better chance of drying. And we'll just put these few little things in a bucket with some water. What I do for the actual harvest is I use this quarter inch screen and people have asked me, how do I catch the cocoons? The cocoons can be caught in this 20th of an inch, which is just a little over one millimeter. I only use this for liquid applications because it takes so long to screen anything through something this small. Because there are blue worms in this bin and their cocoons are so, so tiny, I cannot expect to catch them all. So I really don't use this one hardly at all unless I'm doing um, a worm casting tea that I don't have a bag for and I just want to run everything through the screen so that I can use it in a sprayer. So although I do have the 20th of an inch or one millimeter, I don't use it very often. The work horse in the group is the quarter inch screen. I also have the eighth and the 12th, which I do use every once in a while. But this one, this is my favorite and I've been using it for over five years. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of harvest off the top here and see what I can get. I have been harvesting uh, without you guys, I'm sorry, uh, so that I can get a little bit more ahead on blue because I have been putting other bins on top of here to dry because of the large surface area. And anything that goes on top of the screen or stays on top of the quarter inch screen, it is going to go into the bucket to get wet again. And then it gets to go back to the beginning and start all over again. And I don't know if you can see on the screen here, but there are like pumpkin seeds or squash seeds or, or whatever, and uh, little bits of maybe uh, mulch or something that was from a leftover plant. And of course, any sort of woody object is gonna take years, and that's fine. Um, this bin is a continuous flow that goes horizontally, so it never stops. I'm never trying to harvest the entire bin all at once. So for me, it is totally fine if there are leftovers. And when I'm doing the harvest here, I am kind of breaking up the little clods here, but if it is too wet to harvest, then it just like makes these little pills and it doesn't do any good to try and, and screen it at that point. It's, it's better to just wait till it dries out a little. And when I say dries out a little, um, you don't want it to be bone dry like dust. Uh, you are going to kind of make the uh, beneficial microbes go dormant or die if you do that. So it's just preferable to make sure that it is, you know, in that Goldilocks zone between um, bone dry and uh, too wet to harvest, which is, you know, that just takes experience. And, uh, and by experience, I mean screwing up royally quite a few times in order to get it right. I know that uh, this is not going to be dry enough for me to sieve anymore, so it'll just have to wait till next time. 
So I'm gonna put this into the container where I keep the castings. And I'll show you that a little bit later and show you how I keep those castings alive during the winter until I need them again. One more thing, I do sieve to this particular particle size because this is what looks good. This is not what looks good, but this is what works well in a potting soil or a seed starting mix. Okay, we'll put the screens away here and we'll get to managing the bin. When we're looking at this bin, this part here, more along the lines of this part here, this is done. In theory, there should not be much of any worms in here at all. There's always gonna be a few stragglers that are resistant, but for the most part, when I'm flipping through here, I am not getting any worms. There's probably cocoons, but no, generally there's not any adult worms in this part. And the goal right now is just to make sure that I'm slowly getting this to a moisture level that is going to be siftable and then also at the same time moving it over to the far edge here to make room so that I can feed the worms more. And that is the beauty of the wedge system. I'll put a diagram up there of what the whole process looks like. But, you know, it's kind of like doing a migration continuously. Most of the worms will stay with the food and the really good moisture because that is what is advantageous for them to breed uh, and also, you know, live. Then we get into this part here, which was probably fed two, two and a half, three months ago. And you can see there are some worms here because the moisture is higher and they're comfortable. So why leave if you're comfortable? And they can rework the same castings multiple times. So sometimes people are like, oh God, you only feed once a month, um, how are they not dying? Well, several things. What we look at and say, yes, that's food, and what they perceive as food are two different things. They are eating things that are not exactly microscopic, but pretty close. So we might not see that it looks like food, but they do. So we're gonna continue moving things over. I'm gonna remove my plastic here. This is keeping the active side of the bin nice and happy, keeping the moisture good. So I'm just gonna continue making space here. The, uh, most of the sieving took place off camera over the course of the last week because I can only take maybe two or three pans at a time without making everything too dry. And, uh, you know, that's not good for the worms. And it also can make the castings get really hard as a rock. All of the uh, aggregates that are created within the, the worm bin when the worms and the other critters are moving through it, make the castings very sticky. If you've ever let a worm bin go for too long, you know what I'm talking about, sticky. It seems like they won't ever dry out, and when they do, then you've managed to make uh, concrete balls. All right, now we're getting to the center line here, which is the demarcation for when we fed two times ago. So last time when we looked in on the bin, there were some of those wheat berries left over, and the worms were still working on that. And that's what we're gonna find in this part when we start moving through to the center line. And we might run into some worm balls because they were really, really enjoying all of that, that grain. Now it is negative 32 uh, with the wind chill here where I'm at right now. And it is a nice balmy 65 in the basement, which is actually the sweet spot for the red wigglers and the European night crawlers. The blue worms do prefer it to be warmer, so they go a little bit dormant in the wintertime down in my basement, but that's okay, then the red wigglers and the European night crawlers can shine. Ooh, good worms. I think I have a worm ball here, hold on. I don't, holy cow. All right, there we go. Nice worm ball, good worms. I'm gonna move them to the far end of the bin though. I don't really want them hanging out as I'm flipping through things. Well, it doesn't look like I have any choice. There's a lot of worms right here 
in that um, wheat berry portion. So they are still working on that. You can still see the little vanilla colored beads right here. So the worms might be moving a little bit slower because of that now. And I'm still seeing lots of them, quite honestly. So that's, you know, also to be expected because worms do consume food slower at lower temperatures. And there are a lot of worms in here. I actually have no idea. I haven't done a complete turnover this bin since the rat incident of 2020, 2021. Mm. Cranberry. And I honestly don't even remember putting that cranberry in here. That is how long ago it's been in here. Nine months, maybe. Nine, nine months would probably be a good idea for, for how long a cranberry, if it's not squished, it will take. So if I squish that, it'll still be another couple of months. All right, so the, the wheat berries still moving slow. That's okay. It's nowhere near spring. So we're not gonna, not gonna worry about that. So we're gonna move down to the business end of the bin. So hang on. So we've got the, the dry part off the top. We did put bedding across the full top of this when we uh, fed last time and that is all gone. So when I say that the, the bedding is really super important for the worms, do not neglect your bedding. So looking in here, I think we fed fruits and vegetables last time. So far not seeing anything at all. But I'm just going to move all the big chunks to the end because that's how the wedge system works. More wheat berries. So I did actually take some of those uh, CC treats and put them into the food processor to make sort of a uh, um, worm chow kind of a thing. It's got rice and chocolate and wheat berries. And uh, I've been giving that to all the bins. So because it was kind of a much longer term food than I had anticipated, and I was also afraid that it would um, heat up, wanted to make sure that uh, in the future when I use it, I try and uh, use the blended version of it so that the worms can access it a little faster. So another bit of a worm ball here. But you are seeing a little bit of the bedding. I think all total we put six gallons of bedding in last time when we fed. So it is, it's not surprising that there will be some left. And as far as looking at vegetables, I think that's a little bit of sweet potato. And then down here at the bottom, the paper. I added a gallon of water to this over the last two or three weeks. And it still, to me, feels a little bit dry. Ooh, ooh, okay. Hang on. Looks like we've got another massive worm ball here in the corner, which I'm gonna disturb just so you guys can see it. But when you look at all these, all these worms, you can, sort of see that there are some blue worms in here, um, particularly because they are zipping along so quickly. That's about the only way I can tell them apart is because they are so fast moving. And then the larger creamier color ones with the yellow tails are the European night crawlers. And then the kind of cherry colored ones with the, the yellow tail are the red wigglers. Okay, so we're still flipping. Got another solid worm ball here. You can really see that blue worm there, right in between my two thumbs. How purpley it is, and how fast it is, and how sparkly it is. And there's nothing wrong with blue worms. A lot of people get angry when their worms come in a mix. And quite honestly, yeah, sure. If, I mean, I have a worm channel, so I am trying to show you the difference between the different worm species and how they behave in certain environments. And then also, how they eat certain foods and what their preferences are so that people in any particular area that have any kind of worm, you know, have a basis for that. But, you know, if I was just ye old, you know, worm farmer without a, a worm channel, this mix right here 
it is absolutely golden. The blue worms take over when it gets super hot and the European night crawlers and red wigglers kind of slow down when it gets in the upper 80s Fahrenheit. And then when it gets cold in the winter time down here, then the blue worms can take a nap and the cooler loving species like the red wigglers and the European night crawlers, then they can shine. So I think it's, it's really good in my opinion to have the multiple species of worms. The African night crawlers are way too fussy to be a part of this mix. They would be not happy at the uh, 60 some degrees in the basement down here. They're upstairs with the orchids and the bonsais at a balmy 75 Fahrenheit and they're perfectly happy. If I can keep them, um, keep the moisture up in that bin, then they are perfectly happy. All right, so we have flipped through everything. So now this is the last two feedings kind of combined in here. And there is lots and lots of food here. Okay, here is, I know AV's got his cork that's been in there for like a decade, but here's my little cork that's only been in here for about three years. And quite honestly, it doesn't look any different than it ever did. I guess that's why you can have wine that's 100 years old and the cork is still fine. Um, if my channel goes for that long, we just might, well, I won't live that long, but you know what I mean. Uh, the cork is probably still going to be here when I am not. Okay, so now let's get some of the prepared bedding this time that's uh, already moistened, already has the coconut coir in it, and already has the eggshell, and put that down at the bottom. So that's probably a couple gallons worth. And then I'm going to put the, the siftings in there. Hopefully that will have regenerated them so that they can eat that or, you know, work through that food a little bit easier. Let's get some food. Not a huge feeding, but I do have something weird. This, I, I got this at like an antique show or something. This is tea. Remember back in the stories of the American Revolution where the tea was thrown into the harbor? It wasn't like bags of tea uh, like we eat now or drink now. It was compressed blocks like this. And uh, you use kind of like a cheese grater to grate it. It's not that great. Um, but for $2 or whatever, I was you know happy to buy a little package and uh, see how people 200 years ago drank tea. Uh, but this is what ended up in the Boston Harbor, not tea bags. But let's see what the worms can do with it. Uh, Cause I'm over it. <laughs> All right, so in goes the food and we have uh, apples, some tortilla chips, some oranges, little pieces of ginger. Not a huge feeding, but considering how much good food is left in here, the long-term food, um, then they're gonna be just fine. By the time, they'll probably distribute between here and there. You know, there's like 20 pounds, between 10 and 20 pounds of worms in here. So, you know, you gotta keep them all um, happy. All right, let's get them some more bedding. Okay, so this is another probably four pounds, four pounds, four gallons. And this is why I use coconut coir. This is office paper, um, basically junk mail. And this is why I use the coconut coir, because this is all stuck together. If I leave it in a big clump like this, the worms are never going to get into it. All right, I'm going to put one more thing of new bedding over the top of this to keep all of this nice and uh, covered so the bugs don't want to see it. Put that over the top. And then we can get to talking about what do I do with the worm castings over the course of the winter so that they stay alive and still are able to be bioavailable for the garden in the spring. First things first, cover this up with my packing sheet here. And then I have just like a little, little thing here. Use my buckets to weigh it down and then we can move over to the casting. Okay, so here we are. We have the castings that uh, I have been sifting over the course of the last couple of months. I normally have a lid on it. If you dig down deeper, you can see that it's nice and moist down there. But the stuff that I just sifted today is not. 
So we don't want that to get to a moisture that is uh, not going to support the active biology, which is really the whole point of having worm castings. So I am, it seems like I'm adding a lot, but honestly, when they get a little dry, they become hydrophobic and actually repel water. So I'm adding about three quarters of a gallon here or about three liters and kind of fluffing it in and incorporating it with the other castings that were down below. And the moisture, once I put the lid on, the moisture will kind of even out. So the part that is a little too dry, will get the moisture from the parts that are maybe a little too wet at any one given moment. And then, as I said with the screens, some of the worm cocoons are so small that they will have gone through all of the the screens that I personally use. So in order to make sure that there is food for the little baby worms, um, by the time I use this, I will, I will pull out any adult worms that I find. So in order to get them and make sure that they're healthy, I do add a little bit of worm chow. Not a lot, just a little tiny bit. Kind of fluff that in and then the microbes can start working on it and if and when the the baby worms are born or hatch then they will have access to that food all winter long and i will continue to add to this and depending upon how long winter lasts i could end up filling two of these before everything is over and this is i think it's a 40 gallon 20 gallon this is probably a 20 gallon container and i will probably have 50 gallons by the time i'm ready to uh, start planting in the spring all right guys well if you like the video go ahead and give that a muddy thumbs up and if you're not a member of my worm family click that subscribe button and if you want to know what i'm doing when i'm doing it ring that bell icon the playlist for the 55 gallon bin is right over here and if you've already seen that youtube thinks you're gonna like this video over here all right guys thanks for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody have a good day